Hello, I am Rebecca Melman, and I will be giving a brief whirlwind overview of mammography physics. So here we go. Like much of medical imaging, mammography technology has changed a lot over the past few decades. Film-based mammography is extremely uncommon these days. MQSA only reports six film mammography units that are still in use. Film-based imaging is also no longer covered in any meaningful way on the ABR exam, so I'm not going to be discussing it here. As you can see from the numbers shown here, digital detectors and CR have taken over the mammography world, and the use of breast tomosynthesis has rapidly proliferated over the past decade. There are an estimated 38 million mammography studies that will be performed in 2021. Mammography is unique among imaging modalities in that it's only used to image a single body part. So what do we need in an imaging system designed to only image breasts? First, we need good image contrast for breast tissue. We need to be able to visualize the morphology of a mass as well as distortion of normal breast tissue architecture. So we need an imaging system that can differentiate between fatty tissue, glandular tissue, and masses. All of these things have similar x-ray attenuation properties, so ensuring adequate contrast is especially important. The second thing we need is high spatial resolution. This allows us to determine the shape and spatial configuration of calcifications, which can be very small. The third requirement comes from the use of mammography as a screening tool. Since mammography is used for widespread screening, meaning that most of the patients imaged with mammography are asymptomatic, we have to ensure that the dose is low enough that the potential benefit to an asymptomatic patient still outweighs any risk. Lastly, we want the x-ray field intensity matched to the anatomy of the breast. This will make more sense when I discuss it in a little bit more detail in just a few minutes. For these reasons, mammography uses specialized equipment. So here's a picture of a mammography unit. Systems from different vendors may look slightly different, but they all have the same basic components. This is a digital mammography system with combined conventional, or 2D, and tomosynthesis capabilities. So let's talk a bit about the various parts to this system. One part, although not shown in the previous picture, is the technologist workstation. This is where the technologist sets the imaging parameters for each patient and reviews the images to ensure adequate coverage of the anatomy and adequate image quality. The second component, also not shown in that first image, is the part you're probably most familiar with, the radiologist review workstation. This is where you, as the radiologist, review the images, make a diagnosis, and dictate the report. Last, and certainly not least, is the mammography acquisition system itself. Each of these components have been specially designed to meet the imaging needs I mentioned earlier. Let's take a look at where these components are within the mammography unit, and then we'll look at each component in a bit more detail. The first is the x-ray tube, which is located here in the upper part of the machine. Next is the face shield, which is a plastic piece used to keep the patient's head and neck out of the imaging field of view. Then we have the compression paddle, which is raised and lowered to adequately compress the patient's breast. And finally, there's the breast support, which lays over the image detector. As I mentioned, this is, a, this is a digital detector. Systems that use CR would have a slot in the side of the bre this breast support where the CR plate could be inserted and removed. This image just shows a side view of the x-ray tube. And one thing I wanna point out here is that the x-ray tube, which is inside this gray cylinder, is at an angle. This is done to better match the x-ray field with breast anatomy. Let's look at why this is. This figure on the left shows the setup for a typical non-mammography x-ray tube. Electrons are generated in the cathode, shown here on the left, and travel towards the anode, shown here on the right, producing x-rays. These x-rays are projected down, and the intensity of the x-ray beam is higher on the front side of the anode, since some of the x-rays on the back side of the anode, shown here on the right, are absorbed by the anode itself. We know this is the anode heel effect, and it plays a role in how anatomy is positioned in general radiography. By angling the x-ray tube slightly, we can place the area where the x-ray intensity is highest at the chest wall. This means we're not wasting photons because we don't want them projected past the breast anatomy onto the chest wall side. And it places the most intense part of the x-ray beam over the chest wall side of the breast, which is where breast anatomy is thickest. This all helps to reduce dose to anatomy we're not imaging, and create a more uniform x-ray field across the image detector. 
So in this way, by tilting the x-ray tube, the x-ray field is matched to breast anatomy. The x-ray spectrum is also optimized for imaging breast tissue. Breast tissue and pathology often have low inherent contrast. This is demonstrated by this plot, which shows the linear attenuation coefficient of various tissues as a function of energy. To maximize contrast, we want to use a part of the spectrum where the differences in linear attenuation coefficient are greatest. And we can see here that this occurs at low energies. However, we still need to use energies high enough to adequately penetrate breast tissue and reach the detector, but the lower energies allow improved tissue contrast. This plot on the right shows how the contrast of ductal carcinoma changes with beam energy. Therefore, we use lower energy x-rays for mammographic imaging than in general radiography, around 24 to 42 kb. The target or anode materials used in mammography are molybdenum, rhodium, and tungsten. So let's This plot looks at the spectrum for an unfiltered 30 kvp x-ray beam produced using a molybdenum target. Notice that there are characteristic x-rays produced at 17.5 and 19.6 keV. As with other x-ray spectra, we want to filter out photons that are on the low and high ends of the spectrum. To look at the effect of filtration on the spectrum, we need to consider the k-edge of the filter material. Molybdenum has a k-edge of 20 keV. The effect of filtration is shown by this blue dashed line, showing that the molybdenum filter absorbs many of the low energy photons and the absorption decreases until 20 keV. The graph on the right shows the filtered x-ray beam. Now let's look at the effects of using a rhodium filter on an x-ray beam produced from, from a molybdenum target. The K edge of rhodium is slightly higher than for molybdenum, 23.2 keV. This means that we retain some more of the high energy photons. Clinically, a rhodium filter is used for denser and or thicker breasts when these higher energy photons are needed to adequately penetrate the breast tissue. The image on the right shows the unfiltered spectrum using a molybdenum filter in green and the filtered spectrum using a rhodium filter in orange. Now let's look at the unfiltered spectrum produced by a rhodium target. Characteristic x-rays are produced at 20 keV and 23.5 keV. So what happens if we place a molybdenum filter in the beam? Because the k-edge of molybdenum is 20 keV, we end up filtering out most of the characteristic x-rays at this energy, which we don't want to do. So in practice, we never use molybdenum filtration with a rhodium target. Instead, when we use a rhodium target, we always use rhodium filtration to preserve these peaks, these energy peaks at 20 keV. Let's now look at the spectrum from a tungsten target. All of the mammography units at UCH, Lone Tree, Cherry Creek, and Highlands Ranch have tungsten targets. The pros of using tungsten as a target material is that it has higher power loading than molybdenum or rhodium, meaning it can produce higher MA, which translates into shorter imaging times and less patient motion. On the downside, there are no useful characteristic x-rays produced, and there are unwanted L characteristic x-rays between 8 and 10 keV that we need to filter out. To adequately filter these out to an acceptable level, we need about 0.05 millimeters of rhodium, which is more than what's used in molybdenum or rhodium-based tubes. This plot shows the absorption characteristics of the rhodium filter in magenta, of the silver filter in green, and of an aluminum filter in black. The chart on the right shows the filter spectra obtained using each of these filter materials. This is an image of the part of the mammography unit that contains the filter materials. The x-ray tube is at the top of the image, and just below that, there's a disc that holds different filter materials. It works like those old Viewmaster toys, where there are small windows along the disc, each of which holds a different filter material. For mammography systems with tungsten tubes, the filter materials are typically rhodium, silver, or aluminum. And the disc spins around until the appropriate fi filter window is placed in the x-ray beam. Next, we're going to talk about the compression paddle and why compression is so important in mammography. First, compressing the breast spreads out the breast tissue so there's less overlap. This improves visibility of structures within the breast. Second, the compression helps to decrease motion because the breast is immobilized. 
Third, by compressing the breast tissue, we decrease the thickness of tissues that x-rays are passing through, which reduces scatter and improves x-ray penetration. This gives us better image quality and decreases dose. These days, most mammography systems use some sort of flex paddle design. So instead of having the paddle stay parallel to the image detector, it can bend slightly to allow adequate compression of the nipple side of the breast. Another technique that's used is spot compression. This is used to improve image quality over a small area of the breast and is typically used to zero in on something that may not be clear in the standard view acquired using the full compression paddle. And then there's the image detector. As mentioned before, a CR cassette, or film when that was used, can be slid into the side of the breast support. But these days, most mammography detectors are digital. Mammography also has specialized printers that allow mammograms to be printed onto film at high resolutions, about 50 microns. Until a few years ago, mammography clinics were required by the FDA to have a way to print film so that patients could take copies of their mammograms to other facilities, even if the other facility didn't have the capability to read a digital image. This requirement, however, has gone away, and so fewer and fewer mammography departments even have printers anymore. Because of the need for high spatial resolution in mammography, digital detectors used in these systems typically have a pixel size of, of 70 microns. This is about half the size used in digital detectors for general radiography. Mammography also uses anti-scatter grids, such as the one shown here. The overwhelming majority of mammography is performed using automatic exposure control, or AEC. Similar to general radiography, there's a photo cell above the image detector. There are actually multiple photo cells above the image detector. The ovals and sem semicircles shown on these images indicate where those photo cells are. These photo cells measure the amount of radiation that reaches them and terminates the exposure when a certain dose of the photo cells, and hence the detector, is reached. Mammography can also be performed in magnification mode. We do this by using geometric magnification. A stand is placed above the image detector and the breast is placed on top of the stand. A smaller focal spot is used and the air gap between the magnification stand and the image detector not only magnifies the image, but also reduces the amount of scatter reaching the detector. The image is magnified by a factor between one and a half and two, depending on the height of the stand. Because the air gap reduces scatter, no grid is used, which lowers the MAS that would otherwise be required to perform the study. And again, a small focal spot can be used because of the reduced MAS required, which helps to improve the effective resolution. Another mammography application is stereotactic breast biopsy. Here, the patient's breast is placed under compression. A typical mammogram obtains an image with the x-ray tube in line with the detector. In stereotactic breast biopsy, two images are acquired to create a stereo pair, one image at plus 15 degrees and another at minus 15 degrees. So what this does is, it line, is by lining up the object in both images, we can use geometry to determine the depth of the lesion within the breast. This is used to guide the needle during biopsy. There are also systems that perform stereotactic imaging with the patient upright using a standard mammography unit. The final type of mammography I will discuss is tomosynthesis. Tomosynthesis has been around in x-ray imaging for a very long time, about the past century, but it's only recently been applied to mammograph mammographic imaging. By taking multiple images with the x-ray tube at different angles, we can reconstruct thin slices of the anatomy. This process is diagrammed here. Typically, about 15 projections are obtained through a sweep from about plus 12 and a half to minus 12 and a half degrees. The advantages and disadvantages associated with different numbers of projections and different tube sweep angles is beyond the scope of what I'm discussing here. The advantage of tomosynthesis is that it generates thin slices, about one millimeter thick, where each slice has overlying anatomy removed. This has been shown to reduce the number of false positives, and there have been reports of cancers missed on conventional 2D mammography, but detected on the tomosynthesis slices. One study, known as the STORM study, 
found out found that tomosynthesis increased cancer detection rates across all age groups by 34% and reduced the false positive rate by 17%. There are additional studies that are underway now to help determine which uh, which patients will benefit most from tomosynthesis imaging. This is an example of some reconstructed tomosynthesis slices. So you can see as we kind of move through this pile of slices that various aspects of the breast architecture is more visible in some slices than in others. The other thing that tomosynthesis and so well, these units allow uh, is the creation of a synthetic 2D view. So most facilities acquire a conventional 2D mammography image followed by a tomosynthesis sweep. But more vendors are coming out with software that, that, that can reconstruct the conventional 2D view from the tomosynthesis slices. The FDA approved the use of synthetic 2D views in 2013, but specified that they had to be used in combinations with digital breast tomosynthesis, or DBT. Advantages of synthetic 2D views include a reduction in the total imaging time and a reduction in total radiation, since you're no longer acquiring a separate 2D view. Synthetic 2D mammography combined with DBT, or tomosynthesis, has similar sensitivity and specificity as conventional 2D combined with digital breast tomosynthesis. The main disadvantage is that the synthetic 2D image looks different from the conventional 2D image. Calcifications and architectural distortions may be better visualized, but masses and asymmetries are not as well visualized. This may affect density categoriz categorizations and can introduce artifacts. It also emphasizes that when you're reading at a particular facility, it's really important to determine whether, uh, how the images are being acquired and what images are being presented to you as the radiologist. I mentioned stereotactic breast biopsy previously. Breast biopsies can also be performed under TOMO guidance since the, cre since the creation of thin image slices enables localization of a lesion. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or if you just wanna tell me how much you loved this video.